2 Corinthians chapter number 4 will be our text. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 4, in verse number 3, Paul says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 is what I want to draw your attention to. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The treasure in earthen vessels. Now in the Bible there are many types of vessels. There are vessels that hold different things and vessels that are created to carry out different tasks. Isaiah 22 verse 24, the Bible says, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. So he had different types of vessels. There are some that were used to carry water, 1 Kings 17.10. The Bible tells us about Elijah when he comes to the widow woman. He says, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. You may recall the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she has the water pots of stone and she's got those water pots that she's carrying as a vessel to carry water in. 2 Kings chapter number 4, this is Elisha and the Bible says that he told her, this woman, to go in and take the vessels and fill them up with oil. Vessels to put oil in. There were also precious vessels in the Bible. Uh, precious uh, vessels that were made out of substance that would be very valuable like silver. Proverbs 25 verse 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. 1 Kings chapter number 10, during Solomon's reign, the Bible tells us that all of King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of. All of the vessels were of very precious substance and quality. Now, back here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And when you look at the context, Paul says we are preaching the gospel of Christ. And really, in verse number 1, he says we have this ministry, we faint not. So the context has to do with the ministry. And Paul talks about having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. And he says we preach the word of God. And Paul is basically saying that we are allowing as preachers the gospel of Jesus Christ and the light of Jesus Christ to shine through us as earthen vessels. We're just vessels that He can fill up and He can shine through to manifest His glory. That's the idea. Now when you think back, when God created man, He made Adam, the Bible says, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He inhabited Adam. Now, I say that a little loosely, but really when you think about it, Adam had fellowship with a spiritual being. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And Adam was able to communicate with this being. The Bible says he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. But when he sinned, he broke off that fellowship and something marred the vessel, something messed up the fellowship and relationship he had spiritually as a triune being of body, soul, and spirit. Now Adam's spirit was not able to fellowship with God anymore. When you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, His Holy Spirit came inside of you. God is inside of you if you're saved. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he shall quicken your mortal, mortal bodies. God is inside of you. You are said to be an earthen vessel. Now I want us to look at three vessels 
in the Bible. And when I say three vessels, I'm referring to three individuals, but not just three individuals. I want us to look at three women in the Bible. And not just three women, but three women named Mary in the Bible. Three vessels. Now, you're probably not surprised, maybe, if you've read the New Testament much, but there are at least six and possibly seven different Marys in the New Testament. The name Mary is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Miriam. You remember Moses' sister's name was Miriam, and they tell us that name actually means obstinate or rebellious, rebellion. But really when you study these Marys, you don't really find that in their life, but there are these different Marys. We have obviously Mary, the mother of our Lord. We have Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That's called James the Less when you study the 12 disciples. Then we have Mary, the mother of James and John, which I believe would have been the wife of Cleopas, which would have been the sister-in-law of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So I believe Jesus and James and John were cousins in that respect. Then we have Mary, the mother of John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And then we have Mary mentioned in Romans 16:16, 16, 16, which is not specifically identified. It's possible she is one of these others, and therefore there would only be six, but there's at least six or possibly seven Marys. I want to look at these three vessels, Mary, the mother of our Lord, Mary Magdalene, and Mary of Bethany. Now take your Bible and go over to Luke chapter number 1. Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to name her or term her a pure vessel. Now I'm very well aware that the Roman Catholic Church through the centuries has exalted and magnify, magnified Mary above that which God has set her in Scripture. Mary is not a co-redeemer. Mary cannot hear the prayers of millions of people at the same time. Mary is not the queen of heaven. She is not a goddess. Mary was not conceived without sin. That is the teaching called the Immaculate Conception. Mary was not assumed into heaven after she died. That's called the Assumption of Mary in Roman Catholic teaching. And so Mariolatry, which is worship of Mary, is very true in Catholicism. And the Bible does not present that case at all. However, Mary is presented as a pure or clean vessel. The Bible mentions in Isaiah 66 about those in the millennium bringing an offering to the Lord in a clean vessel. And God picked a clean vessel when He picked the handmaiden, Mary. Look in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 26. Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Notice a few things about this. This is her picking. This is God choosing her. Why did God choose Mary? She had to be a special person for the Lord God Almighty to choose this handmaiden as that vessel that He, through His Holy Spirit, would be incarnated in. God who made man was made man, and He came by way of a woman. He was born into this world by way of a woman. And that woman's name was Mary. And she was a good woman. She was a godly woman. She was a pure woman. Notice the Bible says here that she was a virgin. There's her purity. Notice in verse 28 that she said to be highly favored. She is preferred. Notice verse 28, the Bible says the Lord is with thee. God's presence was with her. Verse number 28, blessed art thou among women. Verse number 30, thou hast found favor with God. 
What a woman for God to say she found favor. It's kind of like when you read in the Old Testament when the Lord talks to the devil about Job. He just brings it up. He says, have you considered my servant Job? The Lord sits around in heaven and he begins to brag on somebody. And he brags on Job. It's kind of like that here with Mary. She found favor in God. There was something about Mary that caught the Lord's attention. And the Lord said, you know, that's a pure woman. That's a pure vessel. That's a clean vessel. I can use that vessel. That vessel would be fit enough for me to inhabit, to be incarnated in. What a privilege. What a privileged position for this woman to be in. Not that we should bow down and worship her and all that garbage, but you have to admit she's a great vessel for the Lord to pick. Verse number 38, notice the, her own idea about herself, her humility. She says, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. And she's willing. She says, Be it unto me according to thy word. Notice, if you keep reading down, whenever she comes to Elizabeth and she begins to talk to Elizabeth, notice down in verse number 47, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Her spirit rejoices, verse 48, her soul magnifies God. Verse number 47 again, I'm sorry. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. I'm sorry, verse 46. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And then verse number 48, notice her estimation of herself. He, he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. She rejoiced in verse number 47 that she was redeemed. Notice in verse number 48 that God regarded her. And also notice in verses 49 through 53 that he rewarded her. She says, why should he think upon somebody like me? Look at it in verse 49. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Do you ever think like that? Think about who God is. Why should he be bothered with the likes like you and me? Who are you that he should even pay attention to you? Who are you and who am I that God should give us the time of day? Yet there was something about Mary that caught his eye. And she says, he hath regarded me. He that is great hath done to me great things. He that is mighty hath done to me great things. Her estimation of herself was low, but God's estimation of her was high. And she was favored in God's sight. She's a pure vessel. Purity goes a long way with God. God's looking for the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart is one of the Beatitudes. You say, well, preacher, nobody can be pure, nobody can be sinless. Don't misconstrue God's words. God still tells you to be holy, and He knows you can't be sinless. But He says, be holy as I am holy. He tells you to be godly and to follow after godliness, knowing that you're ungodly. But the idea is, blessed are the pure in heart. Are you a pure vessel? When that smudge and that, that, uh, that uh, defilement of sin gets on you, do you take it to Calvary and get the blood to wash you clean? Are you a clean and pure vessel? You say, I wonder why God's not using me. I wonder why God doesn't pick me. Pick Mary. How come he doesn't pick me? Maybe you're not pure. Mary was a pure vessel. Notice not just her picking, but notice over in Luke chapter number 2, her pondering. Just kind of going through her life here real quick, and then we'll move on to the other two Marys. Notice in Luke chapter number 2, when the shepherds come, and they had seen this great angelic host vision out here in the, in the, um, in, in the uh, fields, they come in and they tell of everything that had happened in verses 17 and 18. And notice in verse 19, the Bible says, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She pondered some things. Boy, I can imagine so. Can you imagine being a virgin, being engaged, and being very respectable in your community, being a virtuous woman like Ruth was? She was known that she was virtuous. Her reputation was important. Her reputation, not just about what people thought about her, but that people knew that she had a testimony of purity with God. 
And can you imagine what she and Joseph both went through? Their names were drugged through the mud. And she pondered a lot of things, I'm sure. They came in and they began to expound and exposit upon what the angels had said and all those words coming down from heaven, probably just when she needed it. And she pondered those words. And then over in chapter 2, 12 years later, toward the end of the chapter here, you'll notice, or actually verses 25... Uh, let's see, no, verses 41 through the end of the chapter, I'm sorry. Luke chapter number 2, you know the story. Verses 41 through 52, we have Jesus' family all going obviously down to the feast of Passover. And as they come back, a couple of days go by and they kind of lose sight of Jesus. And you know how they go back, Joseph and Mary, they go back to find him and they go back to Jerusalem and they go into the temple. This is all that we've heard of Christ since the since he was a little child that you read about when the wise men came, maybe one or two. But at this point, he's 12 years of age. And she finds him in the temple asking questions and also giving answers to the doctors of the law. And he's asking questions. And then when she finds him, she says, didn't you know we were trying to find you? Notice, come down to verse number um, 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? She's rebuking him. You know, maybe 12 years has gone by. And of course, Jesus Christ is learning obedience. He's growing. He's finding favor with God and with man. Jesus Christ, as a man, had to learn and he had to grow. That's part of the mystery of godliness. He didn't know everything in instantaneously. He didn't understand that he was God in the flesh as the man Christ Jesus. He was infinite, was born in time. And so Mary, through the years, maybe had gotten used. I mean, she knew that Jesus Christ was not a sinner. But that's not to say that he didn't carry on very much like most of the other boys. I mean, he had brothers and sisters. But she rebukes him. And notice the wording here in verse number 48. Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Notice, behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. He corrects her in verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Not about that. That's not what he's correcting her. Notice this. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. You see how those 12 years went by and Joseph just kind of treated him like the firstborn. And the brothers just treated him like the older brother. And Mary had gotten into this thing to where she had gotten so used to him, she just kind of treated him like a normal son. And he says, don't you know that I have another father and my father is God? He corrects her. But she pondered these things. Now let's move on and... Go to Mark chapter number 3 here, and I believe from this passage we can get a couple of things. Mark chapter 3. I want to read, and then we're going to back up, and I'll show you why I'm kind of putting the flavor on this. Mark chapter 3, verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother. Now when it says that, I believe, uh, based on context, this is dealing with his brothers, his brethren. They're mentioned also again in uh, chapter number 6. Then came then his brethren and his mother, and standing went out, sent unto him, calling him. Now he's preaching here. He's been preaching some. And the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Let's stop everything and let me go out and spend time with them, and let me go and give in to what their request is. There's, there's something else going on or he would not respond this way. Look at this. Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about upon them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, 
For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother, implying his mother and his brethren were not listening to him and were not part of that group that were paying attention to his preaching and doing the will of God, following the words from his lips. You say, how can you get that interpretation? Just back up. Back up in Mark chapter 3 and come down after he chooses the 12, verses 18, 19. Verse number 20, Mark 3, 20. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. They're like, man, you got all these people following you, and you're saying all these things, and there, there's some pressure here to stop him because there's these people following, and then there's all this talk, there's all these, you even have this zealot, this Simon Zelotes, he's part of these people that kind of go against the Roman authorities. Jesus is going to get into trouble here. There's pressure from his brothers, and we know that none of his family believe on him until after the resurrection. We know that James, the Lord's brother, believes on him because there's a post-resurrection, there's a, there's a resurrection appearance of Christ to his brother James, Acts chapter 15. He is one of the leaders in the church at Jerusalem. So we see her pressure, then come over to John chapter 19 and notice her piercing. You remember when Simeon saw her and Joseph when they brought Jesus in to be circumcised, John chapter 19. When they brought Jesus to be circumcised there, he held up Jesus and made some statements and he said this, looking at Mary, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Can you imagine her seeing her firstborn son that she raised and then saw the multitudes follow and then saw him do the miracles and the power that he had and to see him crucified on the cross. John chapter 19. Joseph is out of the picture. I believe he's probably passed on. He's died. He may have been a lot older than Mary. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us because it doesn't matter. The Lord did not see that information to be needful. Look in John chapter 19, what Jesus says in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. And then finally we see Mary in Acts chapter number 1 verse 14. She's praying with the disciples. The disciples are there praying with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus. She's a pure vessel and God uses her. Now I want us to talk about Mary Magdalene. Turn over to Luke chapter number 7. Actually Luke chapter 8 and then we'll look in Luke chapter 7. But Luke chapter number 8. Mary Magdalene... I would believe would not represent a pure vessel, but instead she would represent a marred vessel. If you read about the potter over in Jeremiah chapter number 18, the Bible talks about the vessel that was made in the, the, the uh, made of the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Look over in Luke chapter number eight, verse number one. Luke chapter eight, verse number one. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Verse 2, And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now the reason I say this marred vessel, because that stigma seems to follow her the rest of her days. In Mark chapter number 16, when Jesus Christ rises from the dead, and of course we know Mary is there, the Bible mentions this in Mark 16, 9, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. A reminder of Luke chapter 8, verse number 2. Now they say that her city obviously is Magdala, which is the southeastern coast of Galilee. And the historians say that that was known as a city of ill repute. A city where bad men and, might I say, bad women hung out. 
And she said to be there in that city, and she has, obviously, a sin problem. Look over in Luke chapter number 7. I think it's fitting that we have a woman listed here in Luke chapter number 7 that comes to Jesus to anoint him. Now, Jesus Christ is anointed twice by women. And he's anointed once here in Luke chapter number 7 by this woman. And it's an alabaster box of ointment. But he's anointed also in John chapter number 12. We know there by Mary of Bethany. And there's a difference between the accounts here in Luke chapter number 7. You'll notice they're in a Pharisee's house. Verse number 36. His name's given as Simon. Notice in verse 37. Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus said at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Verse 41, There was a certain creditor to which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said, Simon, seest thou this woman? <laughs> That's the only thing Simon has seen since she entered into the house. He's like, what's this woman doing in here? And furthermore, what is Jesus letting this woman kneel down and touch his feet? Doesn't he know she's a bad woman? She's a wicked woman. She's one of these. She's the scum of the earth. She's the scourge of society. Doesn't she, he know she's a marred vessel? She's trash. She's no good. She should just be thrown outside in the city. She should be just cast aside. She can never be anything. She can never be used by God. She's of no use to him. And Jesus says, you seen this woman? That's all Simon has seen in his Phariseeism, in his hypocrisy, in his piety, in his pride, in his pretentious self-righteousness. Seest thou this woman, verse 44? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time that I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Verse 48, And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Her sin, her city, her sickness. The Bible tells us she had infirmities. Oftentimes sin will cause infirmities. There are some sins of the flesh that cause sickness. There are some psychosomatic sins that cause mental illness. She had spirits. But thank God she had a Savior. And Jesus Christ says, even though that vessel has been marred, she's a vessel I can use. She's not the same as Mary, and we're not comparing apples to apples. We're not saying one's better than the other. What we're saying is, get your eyes off the vessel and get it on the Lord Jesus Christ who can use that vessel for His pleasure. Some of you need to learn how to forget your sins like God has forgotten your sins. He cast them in the deepest part of the sea. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Some of you, you can't get past it. God's already over it. You pray about it and he starts singing that song. What sins are you talking about? I remember them no more. From the book of life, they're all torn out. And I can't remember them anymore. And we need to have that same mentality to be able to forgive and to forget. Notice not only that, but come to John chapter number 20. You know the story. John chapter number 20. Jesus Christ rises from the dead. 
And it's amazing that he doesn't first appear to John, the beloved. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's amazing that he doesn't first appear to Peter, that disciple who always is willing to stick his neck out, it seems like. And, of course, he has his problems as well. But it's amazing he doesn't appear to any of the men. And it's amazing he doesn't appear to Mary, his mother, first. But who does he appear to first? It's Mary Magdalene. John chapter number 20. They go into the grave, Peter does, and John. John goes in and sees, says, Hey, Pete, come check this out. And the disciples go away. Verse number 10, verse 11, Mary's still standing out there and she's weeping. You'll notice in verse number 1, Mary Magdalene came early when it was yet dark. She's with another, uh, another Mary at that point. But you'll notice in verse 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, your Father, my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Her sorrow is turned into rejoicing. She loved Jesus Christ. She never got over the fact that he could take a marred vessel and he could use that vessel for his glory and honor. The fact that he could forgive a wretch, a worthless, nobody, no good, and bless her and give her grace and mercy, and forgiveness, and blessings, and promises, and fellowship. She never got over it. The Bible mentions, I gave you Acts 1.14 with Mary, the mother of the Lord, how she was praying. But it also mentions the other women. I believe Mary was there with the disciples there in Acts chapter 1 as well. She's a marred vessel. Always known as the one who had the demons and the devils. But that didn't bother her. She says, yeah, that's, that's what I'm known for. But that's just so God can tell you, show you what he can do with somebody like me. That's not, I'm not the same person I used to be. Now finally, let's come to, um, let's come to Luke chapter 10. Mary of Bethany. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter 10. We have obviously a pure vessel with Mary, the mother of our Lord. We have a marred vessel, Mary Magdalene. And here in Luke chapter number 10, we're introduced to Mary of Bethany. And you'll notice in verse number 38, It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Notice her siblings, not just Martha, but also Lazarus. You'll notice when you come to John uh, chapter number 11, John chapter number 11, it mentions, in verse number 1, there was a certain man sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And so Mary had siblings, Martha and Lazarus. Now, 
Martha would represent the workers in the church. And thank God for the Marthas. Marthas have their problems, obviously. They're focused on just making the biscuits and making sure the table's right. And they're the devil's in the details, right? And they're all worried about this stuff. And Jesus is over there giving this uh, five-point outline with all this material and all these, these nuggets from the, the incarnate Word of God. And Mary's worried about the place settings and worried if they got enough forks on the table and worried if somebody picked up the ice and all that kind of stuff. So Martha's got her problems, but thank God they had something to eat that day. If everybody would have been like Mary, they wouldn't have had nothing to eat. You got to have some of the workers that are willing to do some of the mundane stuff, if you will, some of the stuff that doesn't get recognition or the stuff that maybe doesn't feed your spirit, but it facilitates the other stuff. I'm glad we've got some folks that can put some money in the plate that we can actually have a building and pay the light bill and do those kind of things. And they might not be the ones teaching the Sunday school class or, or the ones doing some of the spiritual stuff, but they're sure making it where we can have those kind of things. Amen. Got to have the workers. What about Lazarus? Now, we don't have time to preach on Lazarus, but man, he used to walk with Christ, but he never walked with Christ until like he did after he was raised from the dead. Something happened to him when he finally died to Lazarus and he rose again. Something will happen to you when you get saved and you've got a spirit that is revived. And he becomes a witness. Thank God for the workers and thank God for the witnesses. But what do we have with Mary of Bethany? We have the worshipers. What we're going to see here with Mary is every time you turn around, she is sitting at Jesus' feet or falling down at his feet in a position of worship. When John sees Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, he falls down at his feet. I believe when we see him on the throne, if we have a crown that we've gotten at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to take it off as quick as we can, and we're going to cast it down at his feet, and we're going to praise him, and we're going to fall down worshiping him, bowing down at his feet. The devil's a, a type, tries to, uh, type, he tries to imitate God desires worship. Just like in Daniel chapter number 3 when Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist, has an image reared up to himself, an image made of himself, and has people to fall down and bow down to it in an act of worship. We should worship God. And Mary, every time you turn around, she's worshiping God. She kneels in study in Luke chapter number 10. But in John chapter number 11, where we are, we have a situation where Lazarus is sick, and you know the story, we don't have time to get into it, but he dies. And Jesus purposely stays longer where he is, rather than coming after he hears the bequest of Mary and Martha about their brother. He purposely stays there so Lazarus will die, and then he tells the disciples, we've got to go because Lazarus is asleep. The disciples say, well, Lord, if he's taking a nap, man, he's doing better than we are. We haven't been able to sleep out here because all these bugs and all this stuff. And he's like, no, he ain't taking a nap. He's dead. And I'm glad I wasn't there because anytime I'm around, nobody can die. But I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him out of sleep, and it's going to be a better story in the end because we're going to have a great miracle, and it's going to be all this glory that comes to God and to myself for doing this. And that's exactly what happens. Four days go by, and here comes Jesus Christ. Martha goes up almost rebuking him. Martha goes up because, you know, she's all on schedule, you know, you got to eat at such and such a time because the grits are going to get cold and so on and so forth. Even though Jesus Christ is being filled with the Spirit and He's just saying all these words and they're coming out and you're never going to hear them again. And Mary's taking all these notes. Martha's like, whoop, we got to stop it. Cut it off. Time to eat. Lazarus is sick. Jesus, where are you at? And she goes out and she says, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Where were you at when we needed you? Then he begins to get into a theological discourse, and she has no idea what it is. He tells her that he's the resurrection and the life, and he gives her information on the resurrection, also the rapture. You want to find the rapture of the church before the Apostle Paul? John chapter number 11. So, well, it's just a uh, revelation of mystery, not of prophecy, and this, that, and the other. There it is, John chapter number 11. Somebody who lives and they never die. She don't understand that. So she goes and says, hey, the master calls for thee. Whether or not he called her, the Bible doesn't tell us. Mary told, Martha rather, told Mary to come. The master wants you. 
I think that she just kind of drummed that up because she didn't, she wasn't getting anywhere with Christ. So Mary does come. Now why didn't Mary come originally? Maybe she had some of the similar feelings with Martha. We know that she says the same exact words that Martha says. Notice it in verse number um, 21. There's Martha's words. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And then come down to Mary's words, verse 32. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. I believe she had the same sentiment. I believe she had gotten bitter at the Lord and she had gotten out of fellowship when he was away. You ever do that? The Lord's been away for a while. He's gone back to heaven. Get out of fellowship because things don't go exactly like we want them to go and he doesn't answer our prayers exactly like we want them to answer them. Well, what does she do? She does what she knows best. She falls down at Jesus' feet. Look in verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. That's the difference in her words in verse 32 and Martha's words. Martha's words are like this, standing toe to toe, eye to eye to Jesus. Mary's words are grabbing him by the feet, weeping. It took her longer to say, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died because it was in between the sobs. And you'll notice it's after she says that in verse 33 when Jesus therefore saw her, what? Weeping. And the Jews also weeping. He was troubled. Verse 34, where have you laid him? Verse 35, Jesus wept. Why does that response come? Because Mary of Bethany is kneeling, not in study at this point, but she's kneeling in sorrow. And there's a difference in her sorrow and Martha's sorrow. Martha's sorrow has turned to bitterness. Mary's sorrow is still in sweetness, and she is worshiping Jesus. She's like, Lord, we depend on you. And she's holding him by the feet. I come out of chapter 12 and I'll, I'll reveal to you the type of vessel that Mary is. I think it's real evident. Verse number 1, Then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. When you read the other accounts, you find out that she took that box, alabaster box. It's a type of stone like marble. It came from alabastrostron, alabastron from Egypt. And it was a very precious oil inside of there developed from the uh, spike roots of the, of the nard plant. And they say that that whole thing would have been a year's wages. And she took the box and broke it. The vessel was broken. Martha, I mean Mary, is a broken vessel. She's broken. At his feet she found clarification she needed to live by way of study. At his feet she found comfort that she needed in sorrow. And at his feet, she found commendation. When he makes the statement, it's not here, but he says in another place, whithersoever the, this gospel is preached, what she hath done will be told. He rebukes the disciples and he commends her. You say, why? Because it is a sacrifice. Who knows what this very expensive thing was? Maybe this was her dowry. Maybe this was her life saving passed down from her parents. Maybe this was 
everything she had in total. And she was willing to sacrifice it. We give off of the top. Oftentimes we are spoiled rotten Americans. We have more money than we know what to do with. And we very rarely give in worship. You say, what is that? Giving in brokenness and giving in sacrifice. It's a whole lot harder to say, praise the Lord, God is good, when some bad things have happened in your life. When there's been some sorrow. When there's been something that would just wrench your heart in two. It's a whole lot harder to praise God. But you know, praise is supposed to be sacrifice. It's called the sacrifice of praise in Hebrews. It's a fruit, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks. God can't thank Himself. He wants us to thank Him. And it comes from a broken and contrite spirit. That's what David says, a broken and a contrite spirit, O God, thou wilt not despise. What type of vessel are you? Are you a broken vessel? God does not despise that. He sees those tears. He says in Psalms, He puts those tears in the bottle. He'll collect all those tears. What matters to Him is that you're broken before Him. The Lord wants us to be a vessel that He can use. It's interesting, when Jesus met the woman at the well, He came to her and he struck up the conversation and he says, Give me some of that water. And she says, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? When he said he had living water to give her. Notice she said, You don't even have any vessels. And he's like, Yeah, because I want you to be my vessel. You know what she did in that passage? She left her water pot. She just left him. In John chapter 2, when he turns the water into wine, there are six water pots there. And they have to be empty before they can be filled. The Lord wants to use us as a vessel. Paul says, an earthen vessel that it can shine. He speaks over in Luke chapter number 8 about lighting a candle and covering it with a vessel. No man covereth it with a vessel. Uh, you can put out the light of Christ by covering it with a vessel. Or you can do like Gideon and have the pitchers, and those pitchers can be broken. And through those vessels, the light can shine out. We should be a vessel, 2 Timothy chapter 2, purged, a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meat for the master's use. What type of vessel are you? Three different vessels, a pure vessel a marred vessel, a broken vessel. The Bible tells us about the Apostle Paul that he was a chosen vessel. God wants to use each and every one of us. Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm marred. Lord, I'm seeking to be a pure vessel and I just want to be used. Are you willing to be used by God? He'll use you if you're willing. And He wants to use us. It's a mystery of mysteries that He would even pour His own Spirit into us. Pour His life into us so we can pour the life of God by way of example and testimony into the lives of other people. Father, thank You for the Scripture. Thank You for these great examples, Lord. It's amazing what You've done through these people and they're willing to let You use them. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to be willing and surrendered that you will use us as vessels meet for the Master's use. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.